last August we went to the uh, YMCA of the Rockies, and this guy here, Jan Manning, part-time instructor at the Colorado State, gave a presentation on Mountain Man slash Iron Thumb. I'm going to ask you at the end what this means, so pay attention. And uh, some other questions that I that will come up during this presentation. <clears throat> um, definition, what's a mountain man? It's a male fur trapper that lives in the wilderness. That's what Google says. That's about all it is. This time period was between 1835 and 1850. There's about a 15-year period there that these people uh, did a lot of trapping in the, uh, in the western part of the U.S. And there's two events that took place in 1850 which caused the demise of the mountain man. That's another question I've come up with. Or an answer. And we'll get to that at the end of the presentation. And also remember Iron Thumb. If you don't get these, that's okay. It's to get you involved in the discussion. Uh, they came about because of the expansion and the earnings by, of the fur trade in this period. And the fashion trends in the big cities like New York, London, Paris, and others the fashion was beaver furs. And if you lived in one of these cities and was a member of the upper class, you probably had two or three beaver hats, and they were pretty expensive. Well, that drove this market for about 15 years. And it was probably, in this period of time, no more than a 1,000 trappers in, in the West trapping beaver. And their ethnic background was mostly French Canadian, but there were some Spaniards, some English, and some Scotch Irish. But they made up pretty much the entire 1,000 that were there at that time. Now, what kind of men were they as to personality? <coughs> were they honorable, law abiding? No, not they were a bunch so, of outlaws. Not so much, yeah. <laughs> they were uh, romanticized by Hollywood, uh, Jeremiah Johnson, Grizzly Adams. They were not those kind of people. These were arrogant, boastful, and they didn't abide by the law. They usually uh, were, were in groups, and they went to the hunt beaver because it was really harsh living. Living was hard and dying was easy. They formed what they called brigades. Brigades was a, was a French word, and the leader of the brigade was called a blues way. And the reason they, they farmed together was because it was so difficult to live in that environment. And you had hostile enemies to deal with. You had uh, the raw winters that were there. And there were lots of disease at that time. So living alone was, wasn't smart. In fact, if you went out there alone, you probably wouldn't last a year. And if you did, you were lucky. So that was, it was really a very rough environment. Count a snowstorm. Yeah. <laughs> now, why did the trappers believe there are beavers in the West? Well, there's plenty of water and soft bark trees, but there's another reason. What's that other reason? Why did they believe that they weren't there? What made them aware of the fact that there must be a haven of beavers in the West? Did you the traders no. Not many people out there? No. The diaries of Lewis and Clark told him that there, the West was full of beavers. And based on that information, plus they knew there was water in soft park trees, they thought, well, this is a place where there's plenty of beavers. And so that's why they migrated west to hunt for beavers. So what materials did they always have with them? They always had a long rifle. Beaver trap rifles. Beaver traps, hand axe, knives, and always dressed in buckskin for some reason. And they dressed in layers, because they realized that layers would keep them warm during those long winter months. Mm -hmm. And usually, in the winter time, they would uh, house with some friendly Indian tribes <coughs> to survive the winters. And the trapping was done when the ice was out, mm -hmm. called ice out. The rifle that they used is a famous <coughs> rifle. It's called a Rocky Mountain Rifle. Do you know who the manufacturer of that rifle was? No. No. But you 
said. Springfield? No. It was Hawking. Hawking rifles. Hawking rifles were made in St. Louis. <coughs> and they were, if you didn't have a Hawking rifle, you didn't have the right weapon. They were 54 caliber. Each bark has pretty good size, isn't it? And they're a flintlock or percussion cap. They usually, these people use flintlock because I guess they just weren't accustomed to <coughs> Um, another reason they grouped themselves in uh, six or eight is because if they were attacked by hostile Indians, it took 45 minutes to load and reload. 45 seconds. Oh. 45 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty much a chore. So if you're by yourself, the best shot you could do would be to get off one shot that you're probably taken care of. Uh, they, they used many balls, and uh, they were good at about 400 yards. So they were pretty accurate. There was another uh, detriment to living in the West, and it was a wild animal. Which animal would that have been? Mountain lion. Bear, grizzly bear. A lot of them were attacked by grizzly bears, and some of them survived, a lot of them did not. But the hawk and rifle felt was kind of interesting. There's a museum over there in St. Louis, uh, Virginia and her teacher friends went to visit that museum. It's the Hawken House, and it shows the history of the Hawken rifle, which was, I guess, a pretty credible weapon uh, at that time. So what contribution did the Society of Trade make <coughs> since it was less than a thousand years? Well, it helped the settlement of the West. They explored most of the country west of the Mississippi River. That's when they weren't trapping. So they knew all the trails across the mountains. They were friends with the, uh, with the Indians. A lot of them married Indian had Indian wives. So when those wagon trains were west, they knew the passes to go through. Uh, they were knowledgeable about uh, herbal remedies because there was a lot of sickness. And so that's how the West was developed. It probably would have happened, but it wouldn't have happened as quickly uh, had it not been for these people. Now. There are two uh, that I'm going to mention. Kit Carson and Jim Bridger were Army scouts, and they also became wagon train guides, and they were very helpful in getting, like I said, these people to the West. They had knowledge of the trails, they could talk to the Native Americans, and they could offer medical help, because, again, there was a lot of sickness, and they, they had knowledge of the herbal remedies, which they got from living with the Indians. Uh, Kit Carson had, I think, three wives, not one time. He had three Indian wives. That would be big of him. <coughs> what? That would be big of him. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he had ten children. <laughs> he he was, uh, achieved the rank of Brigadier General, always with the uh, scout with the army. So he was a smart guy. He died relatively young. I think it was in the early 50s. And they believe he died because of the harsh environment he lived with in, in those years that he was a, a traveler. Really harsh. Um, let's see. Getting back to my question. So what happened in 1850 to cause the demise of this activity? Fashion change. Fashion change. And what else? So, no. Trains. Trains? No. Short commuters. Exactly. They almost decimated the beaver population. In fact, in 1950, the U.S. Wildlife Service did a survey and they determined that the beaver had returned to its original numbers in 100 years after this event took place. Uh, what does Iron Thumb mean? Caught the trap. Uh, you're kind of on track there. It was hard to set the trap. Exactly. Hard to set the trap. You had to have an Iron Thumb to set the trap. Um, this Mr. <coughs> Manning uh, is an instructor at uh, CSU and also a black powder burner. I don't know exactly what that is, but I guess he fires muskets or something. But he gave this presentation, and there's probably 100 people in the audience. And he walked into the room, put a bucket in front of him, he was dressed in a bucket, and before he started going over and spit in the bucket. That's what he did the entire, he was chewing tobacco, he was trying to play the role. Had the uh, uh, hawk and rifle with him and he had all the uh, traffic.
Did he offer you a chaw? <laughs> <laughs> Gave him a drink really afterwards, though. What's that? Gave him a drink afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> he was, uh, he was really, I thought, a great guy in the crowd. Gave him a big hand as he talked for about 40 minutes. Answered all the questions. And I guess he's, he's asked back each year because this organization puts on programs every week uh, for the entire summer relative to, to speakers that come to speak about various problems. So that's the history of the mountain man, and uh, I covered most of it. So that's your history lesson.